if you can say what is the superpower of developer relations, that empathy. I understand how developers work and how they love or hate my product. And just to give you an example, whenever I hire someone from for a DevRel position, I ask them what's broken with our API. Welcome fellow avocados to Developer Advocast, a podcast where we learn how the proverbial guacamole is made directly <laughs> from some of the most prolific dev advocates around. My name is Jeremy Hess, head of DevRel at Aquiles.io. And since you've already heard me, I'm Sharon Zisman, the bane of Jeremy's existence <laughs> and his jokes. Uh, I like to call myself the chief manual reader at rtfm.dev. And we plan to bring you every two to three weeks uh, new episodes and we'll be interviewing some awesome folks. We'll be joking around because that's what me and Jeremy do. And, you know, bringing, uh, you know, really great topics that we want to talk about in the DevRel sphere. And uh, every episode, we'll start off with some community updates, uh, a little bit of banter, uh, and then uh, we'll bring in our guest. And uh, we promise not to take more than 30 minutes of your time. Uh, and we really hope that you subscribe on Apple or Spotify. And uh, please give us a five-star rating. Here we go. Here goes nothing. All right, everyone. So welcome to the podcast. First of all, I want to give a shout out to Norley Harrell, who coined the name of this podcast, Developer Advocast, which I think is pretty brilliant. And we hope that she'll guest with us uh, in the future. Uh, so great job, Nor. And we're really excited to get this off the ground. Um, I do actually want to take a minute to um, think about the, the Ukraine and everything that's happening there. We're going through a pretty dark time in history right now um, that puts all of our fundamentals into question. Um, we want to send some really strong hug ops to our Ukrainian friends, former colleagues, and um, everyone who's there and hope that they're staying safe. Um, and we also just uh, want to give a shout out to folks that are doing really, really good work and sharing um, resources, links, and things that you should be aware of. Um, so definitely Sasha Rosenbaum on, uh, on Twitter. She's been doing a really great job. Um, Divine you can follow ops, her. Yeah. Divine Ops, that's her, exactly. And Anton Babenko, uh, organizer of DevOps Days Oslo, has been sharing a lot of really excellent resources. So um, if that's interesting to you and you want to contribute, um, there are definitely folks that you can follow and they can uh, help you get pointed towards good resources. Thanks for that, Sharon. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, on we'll go back to a little bit lighter note, um, getting back to the podcast itself. We're trying to keep it, you know, fun and, and light. So we just, as part of DevOps Days and the DevOps Days community, uh, Sharon and I, uh, we love our DevOps Days Tel Aviv community, of course. And we love and appreciate all of the other DevOps Days organizers. You're all fantastic. So we just want to give a shout out to the community. Uh, let everybody know CFPs are always open. So please go to DevOpsDays.org. Find your CFP, find your local DevOps Days or the closest one to you or even the furthest one from you and fly. Um, and let's uh, let, you know get those CFPs running and rolling. And one uh, shout out, which we try to give, if we can, one or two shout outs to some other, uh, you know, DevRel uh, people out there um, from locally, actually, uh, Ben Greenberg, uh, who Ooh. just moved and yeah, is at New Relic. Um, he did a fantastic uh, uh, interview with Ayar Zilberman from uh, Datri, and uh, it's really, really cool. Uh, you should definitely check it out. It's talking about doing open source from day one. Uh, so I think uh, if you have a quick search on, you know, Google for that, you'll probably find it. Uh, if we're and... talking about open source. Yeah. All right. This is the time, Jeremy. This is it. Uh, fair. I've decided to move back to Android. I bought an iPhone a couple months ago and that's it. I'm fed up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm excited to actually have our first and very exciting guest here, uh, Amir, and we'll introduce him shortly because he is the head of product and I want to hear his take on that also. But really... Everyone has like this phrase that they use, iPhone, it just works. First of all, it just works because the APIs are all restricted. And so the applications are so limited in their capabilities. Um, but really, there, I have had so many bugs. Everything that I've ever Googled that I've had a bug and I was like, is it just me? Because everyone says iPhone, it just works. There are a million forum like posts about them. Just nobody cares and nobody actually answers them. <laughs> Apple. Like uh, yesterday, I just, I was fed up with uh, my hotspot just getting disconnected every single second. I'm like, is this just me? Like I'm in the car and the whole time I'm almost running, running over a biker. I'm almost there going up on the island. I'm like, 
you know, about the, the, to, to die in a car accident because I can't get my Wi-Fi hotspot working, which auto magically works with Android, by the way, with Tasker. I would just go in, connect to my Bluetooth, and then it would automatically turn on my uh, personal hotspot. And then there was Wi-Fi magic in the car all the time. Not with iPhone, not so. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still an iPhone. I'm an, pretty much an Apple guy for life at this point. I don't know how I'm going to go back. Uh, Amir, you got to tell us, you know, right. what's your preference? So this is what's the one that we want to introduce our very guest. first guest. Uh, I want to just introduce him here really, really quickly. So, not, so we it. want to really bring you uh, Tel Aviv's most successful DevRel export, Amir Shvat, who today is the head of product of the, and of developer platform at Twitter. Um, and he's a product guy. So yes, please do chime in on your opinion here. We'd love to so first it. of all, thank you for having me in this podcast. Um, I think that as a person who worked at uh, Android, I'm very thankful for you for choosing Android. Uh, I, I think that that's awesome. Um, I'm, today I'm using uh, iPhone as well. And I think it's all a matter of like, um, you need to get used to uh, the schema, the UI schema. Uh, both of them have a very different way of looking at things. Uh, with iPhone, it's all about the defaults. Uh, and with Android, it's all about the configuration and the setup. And I think it, it appeals to different personas um, and, and you can find the good things. Um, iPhone just tells you, hey, I know what's best for you. Don't worry about it. And the, the, the sad thing is that it, they're usually right. For the majority of the people, the, they're usually right with their defaults. But if you're techie and used to the Android and its uh, flexibility, it's really, really hard to adjust because you want your phone to be just right like you like it. And that's where Android shines. Sort of like opinionated versus unopinionated almost. Yes, like uh, exactly. iPhone is just opinionated where we know yes. how it works. We know what works best. We like it. And I'm, yep. I'm on board. I'm on board with that. I'm easy. I did start with Android way, way, you know, at the beginning, like the Galaxy S1. Sharon remembers it when we spoke about this. Yeah, of course. But, I uh, that. My, experience wasn't, my experience wasn't unfortunately fantastic there. So I guess it kind of pushed me in the iPhone. So like since the iPhone 3G, I've just been an iPhone person. That's it. All right, we won't take up the whole episode with our uh, okay. iPhone no, we can't versus do that. Android. And this Wait, this isn't the uh, tech. Done. This isn't the tech talk <laughs> podcast. I, this isn't. The, this isn't the content of the, of the podcast, uh, unfortunately. Although we can talk about it all day, um, but yeah, so we definitely uh, we brought on Amir because really uh, he has such a wealth of experience in the world of DevRel, and he just seemed like the very perfect first guest to have. Um, and so, just kind of to set the stage, um, and there's always been a lot of confusion around, you know, DevRel. Um, I'd love you, uh, from, you know, your many years in the industry to kind of just to demystify for us the different disciplines where each one comes into play. So there's developer relations, which is kind of the general, I guess, um, bucket for, for everything that falls under the kind of the, that area. Uh, today you see also roles of specifically that are developer experience. There's of course, dev advocacy evangelism. So I'd love to hear your take okay. on that. So um, I think every company sees it in a different way, and that's okay. Uh, and words are hard, especially when you have a job description. Uh, defining your words is uh, defining the the job title is hard. The way I've seen it being more effective is you have an organization that's called DevRel, Developer Relations. Um, it usually sits under product or engineering, and its job it is to inspire, educate, and create the tools that enable developers and then getting feedback from developers. So it's basically um, an organization that works, ambassadors, technical ambassadors that work with developers, but also create the tools and services that they need, developer experience. Um, they also create feedback. So they do a little bit of like user research or uh, product work. So it's a multidisciplinary uh, organization uh, which I love, and I've been in multiple roles at in multiple companies. Um, in Google, it was actually under uh, engineering. Um, and we had a great time because we were working with the engineers. A lot of the work that we've done was uh, with engineering. Um, so under uh, this umbrella called developer relations, you have multiple disciplines. You have uh, the developer advocates. Their job is to create scalable content. They create the videos, they create the tutorials, they create uh, the, um, they could create sample codes that uh, developers could use. So they do the one to many. There's uh, sometimes uh, solution engineers. They do the one to few, they work with, or partner engineers. They work with selected partners um, or, or big uh, customers. 
uh, of your platform. Um, you have developer experience, which are or uh, dev ex engineers uh, whose job it is to create the tools and services that you need. So they create the SDKs, they create the sandboxes, um, they create the debugging tools, um, everything that you as over the API, over the platform, that all the tools that you'll need to do. Um, there are usually also technical writers who write the, the actual specs of the, sorry, the actual uh, docs for the API. And there's multiple other disciplines, but these are more or less uh, the main. Um, you, you mentioned uh, evangelism, which I feel very strongly about. I don't think uh, the role should be an evangelist. Um, I, I used to work at Microsoft and it was like, praise the Lord, here's our API. And if it was broken, is like, this is by design. You are not supposed <laughs> to use it that way. And, 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 and I don't like that type of uh, relationship. I like the, when I was at Slack, it was like, hey, this is our API. And if it's broken, we'll work together with you to fix it. So I think that like developer relations and an advocacy role, uh, a bi-directional advocacy role, is pretty um, useful for the for the profession because you create this like uh, multi-directional loop that helps uh, you advocate outside, but also advocate inside for the need of developers. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, that was a great breakdown. So uh, actually I have a question about kind of a little bit about your history, just to get a quick insight. Um, what really was it that got you interested in DevRel to begin with? What was the, what was the impetus? What was the, what brought you here? So I was an engineer um, and I, um, I was a Java engineer, backend engineer, algorithms and stuff like that. Um, my, my biggest mistake was not joining Google in 99 when I, wrote an article, when I wrote an article about distributed transaction and how they suck in an infinitely scalable um, world. And they, ca they called me and they said, you should join us. Um, and, but they, didn't, they couldn't afford the flight. I had to pay for the flight and I told him no. Wow. And I would have probably <laughs> be able to buy that plane if I said yes. Uh, that's, that's life. Um, but uh, I always liked it. I, I always enjoyed creating content. So even when I was an engineer, I, I used to blog about my, my, my code and write content. Um, and it was very useful. And also um, I made some money out of it. So O'Reilly paid me in the early days for like blog posts and, and Java. Um, and then when a friend of mine joined DevRel in, um, in Microsoft, I said, oh, that's interesting. You can actually do that for a living? Like nobody knew what DevRel was. It was like, uh, I could actually create content and talk to developers and uh, be a part of the community. And that like, made me fall in love. But I, the biggest realization I had was uh, when I did executive uh, coaching in Amazon and we worked on what motivates you as a person. And what I found is that what really motivates me is to build something that other people use to innovate. And that, I think that's the core of developer relations. The core is like you create something and other people create on top of that things that you couldn't even imagine. When, when we saw things that like, when I saw the amazing startups that we had in Israel over Android or over Google Maps API, or over any of the things that we've uh, built here uh, when I was at Google, I was amazed. And that was like, that made me so happy to have other people build their business and, uh, and feed their kids and hire amazing people and change the world on top of what you've built. Yeah, that's, uh, it's clearly well, am amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's amazing value. I mean, look, we, we haven't even mentioned every company. So Sharona, you know, let's here it you know, goes. Let, here let, goes, we, right? here so, goes. Yeah, we got that. You mentioned some briefly, but here it goes. So Microsoft, Google, Slack, Twitch, Twitter, they all have a mirror in common, right? So uh I think they all, also probably... have a lot of other smart people in common. So it's <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh so he so Amir definitely has an incredible it's a journey. It's a journey. Wow. Um, okay. I was very so, lucky. What, what are some of the things that were similar at the different organizations and what were different? What are like kind of some of their challenges you faced on a regular basis uh, in these different roles? So I think developer relations, first of all, the first thing that we've faced in the early on um, was people didn't understand what the role was. We, they, they thought we were other uh, salespeople, uh, technical salespeople, or that we were marketing 
the role was not clear. It was not defined as well. Uh, at Microsoft, at a certain point, um, there were quotas given to developer relations, which I think is a horrible thing to do. Because once you move developer relations into sales, first of all, as an engineer, I'm a very bad salesperson. And second of all, you, you, you create an incentive that makes me not being happy because my job is to enable and work with developers. And when I need them to buy stuff, I have a different set of incentives, right? I don't need to help them. I need them to buy stuff. So I think that like that's, that's an interesting challenge. Um, another challenge which I always hear about is funding. Because people don't understand what developer relation is or they don't understand how it impacts the bottom line of the company, um, it's hard for developer relations to get funded. And as a DevRel leader, I always encourage other, other leaders to think about like, what is the most important thing for your uh, organizational, what for the company's uh, future? What is the top KPIs and how what you do now really impacts that KPI? So I'll give you an example. At Slack, we showed that 97% of the customers who pay us use the API the platform. And that was always number one, two, or three of the reasons they love the product. Um, and we showed that once you integrate Slack into three or four other systems, the chances that you will uninstall Slack is extremely low, drops like crazy. So once you connect the, the important things that, that matter to the company, retention, engagement, satisfaction, you tie it into what you do to develop relations, then you're almost, almost like unlimited funding. Um, but if you don't, you become this like weird organization outside that nobody knows really why they're, they're having. Uh, so that's a, that's a big challenge. Uh, there's also multiple, I can talk about challenges for a lot, very long time. Yeah, you, you, have, you, have, you have to know your metrics though. You have to know yes. what you're, what you're, you know, and you have to survey and you have to understand it's, it's so much, it's one of those things that kind of, as a, someone who comes sort of from a more marketing background, I always think like, well, you know, the more you keep messaging people is don't, don't they get annoyed? But when you're talking about developers that love your product, they love to hear from you and they want to tell you how they feel about it. Yes. So. A hundred percent. The KPIs is super important. At Slack, it took us a very long while to figure out what is the key KPI that we want to move. And it was also a very complex KPI. It was number of developers with weekly active tokens, which means I've created the token with the Slack API. And now that integration is working on, an, on a weekly basis. So it's not just like that I played with the API. It actually that what I built actually creates value for users. So that was uh, a complex, but very useful way to measure what we've done in, in, in developer relations. Wow. Very interesting. So a uh, little bit more what about building tools, like, you know, continuing on that, that thread is what, in terms of the DevRel role, of course, and the, the role that it has in, in helping build tools that delight developers, um, yep. you know, and, and making sure that they're well adopted. How does that process work for you? So it, it really depends on like uh, the way I look at developer relations in general is through a funnel. Like what is a developer funnel? How many developers are aware of what I'm building? How many of them are, uh, I've actually tried it? How many of them are proficient? And how many of them have converted to whatever I want, whether paid or uh, highly using or building successful businesses on top of it? And Building the tools is a way to move developers from like uh, using once to being proficient at it. Or so, for example, a study that we just did in uh, Twitter suggested that if we create SDKs that are um, maintained by us, that will drive a lot of deep usage of our API. Currently, we only have third-party uh, SDKs. And we have interviewed many, many developers and the realization was like, we need to develop our own set of like maintained SDKs in the top languages so that developers will have a easier zero to hero or uh, five minutes to hello world experience, which in my mind is one of the most important things in, in a developer experience company. Uh, onboarding is 
one of the onboarding and documentation is probably the most important thing that you could have in a developer uh, platform. I agree. That's actually an interesting point. I have a specific question about that. Uh, what What is the aspect kind of, what is that sentiment that you understood? Is it like kind of the consistency of the experience? Is it the trust that they had in the application that they wanted Twitter to be the ones that, that are developing it? Like, I'm just wondering how that. Uh, it's, it's consistency. It's um, because we're developing a lot of rapid APIs now. So we're, uh, since I, uh, in, in the last year, we've been releasing a lot of APIs uh, that are very um, much uh, after every feature that we have in the app, in the Twitter uh, app, we're releasing an API uh, to support that feature. So we're having a lot of new APIs coming in and the SDKs take their time because like, you know, yeah. they're maintained by people who have a day job. Um, and, and also there's a new API in town called V2 which is growing and is much more secure and much more stable. And it takes time for people to develop SDKs in different languages for that, that V2. So basically what we heard from developers, and this, this was an extensive study that like uh, migrating and starting really requires a set of like highly supported tools and SDKs that they could use to, uh, to, get to, to adopt to the new features that we're releasing all the time. Interesting. Kind of brings us back to the Android iPhone debate of like kind of that fragmentation in the market and the consistency of rolling out new versions with Android yes. versus iPhone, which is like a single, yeah, it's interesting. Exactly. Um, very cool. Um, so we can't not mention the, uh, the huge success that you had with, uh, you know, the recent acquisition of Reshuffle by Twitter. Uh, and for us, I feel like, you know, obviously the DevRel background that you came with uh, probably helped you succeed on that journey and really calibrate the product market fit. So tell us a little bit about that journey and really how your experience helped you kind of in your CPO role and your product role and kind of get it right. Um, so one of the things that I think I brought from developer relations, which I see in every, almost every developer relations person is a strong empathy, which is if you, if you can say, what is the superpower of developer relations? That empathy. I understand how developers work and how they love or hate my product. And just to give you an example, whenever I hire someone from, for a DevRel position, I ask them what's broken with our API. What's not working? I don't ask them what is like the use case and or like what is broken. If they can't articulate something that is broken or wrong or um, misleading or whatever problem you have in an API, if they can articulate the problem, they probably can't be a good developer relation. So I think that the one thing that I brought into Reshuffle was a lot of uh, empathy. And I built mechanisms to get empathy into the entire company. For example, we interviewed developers to uh, onboarding on our platform on a weekly basis. We got people to use our product and to give us feedback all the time. Um, we tried to build in the open. So every time we released a feature, we wrote, we actually used our product and uh, which is something that I've seen a lot of startups fail at. They built an API, but they don't actually use it. Um, and I've seen big companies do that as well. Um, so building uh, empathy and, and understanding how your users are using your product um, is something that I, like a superpower that DevRels have, and I try to bring it into, into the product world. Um, the second thing is like working with other people who are like-minded. One of the big things that made us join Twitter is the crazy passion that we saw in the developer platform in Twitter and the opportunity to like change the world through APIs, which is kind of geeky, but like that's the story of my life, right? <laughs> Trying to, uh, to create APIs that help developers change the world. And when I spoke to the people at Twitter, like we, we share the same passion. So um, when, we, when we did the merger, it was, uh, it was an slightly a no brainer because there were like people that we enjoyed working with. Oh, that's awesome. Well, really you cool. literally wrote the book on APIs, right? And uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was that was fun. Um, I can tell you that like writing a book is not as easy as he thinks. I, I thought it was. Much I don't easier. think it is at all. To be I never thought it was. No, I definitely I didn't think it was easy. <laughs> a lot. You wrote you wrote two of them, right? For O'Reilly. 
Yeah, and for the first one, I came all guns blazing, and they said, like, could you finish it in three months? And I'm like, I'm an engineer. I can finish anything in three months. Apparently, <laughs> I can't. I can't finish anything in three months. It was a, it was a horrible experience. We were like, my mm. kids were on the beach and vacation, and I was sitting on a, next to a tree writing chapters awesome. of the book. Um, but uh, I learned my lesson, and now I know how long it takes. You always have to take another, you know, 20% on the sprint, don't you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and learn from the experience is the key. So in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, when we're talking about some, some, like, I'll just ask the question. What do you think are some of the most critical aspects to think about um, when building uh, dev first tools and dev focused organizations and what are the pitfalls? So, um, I think the first thing is to understand what's the value proposition for our customers. Um, and the pitfall is not focusing on a single customer. Uh, you need to focus on a single customer and a single use case, and you need to provide a lot of value. Uh, developers are, uh, I love them. I'm one of them. We're judgmental. We're, um, we're used to our, th- our ways. Um, it needs to be super uh, sexy and super valuable for me to change my ways. Um, And I'm also a savvy user. So if it's not helping me in a a big way, and I'll tell everyone about it. So create a strong value proposition. Then reduce hurdles to adoption. Very important. If I can't get to use that tool or service within five minutes, I will probably not uh, spend my time unless it's like mandatory. Uh, so five minutes to hello world, strong, useful onboarding that makes me um, experience success within a very short time is very critical. Then there's the table stakes, which is like good documentation, um, the right tools to use uh, the product, integration into my current tools, super important. Um, does it play nice with my CICD, with my IDE, with my... Uh, with the programming language that I use. Um, so these are like core things that you would want to, to create. And then a good set of founders that are members of the community. If you look at amazing, great uh, dev tools, their founders are poster childs for these, uh, for the domains that they're, um, that they're representing. Uh, Aggie from Kong HQ has been talking mm-hmm. about uh, microservices forever. So when he came to and talked about like an API gateway, it was like, yes, of course, Aggie needs to build an API gateway, an open source (laughs) API gateway. So that's the type of thing, like being a member of the community and building in the open uh, together with solving the table stakes and creating a very strong value proposition. I think that's the, that's the core success of building a, a good dev tool. Cool. Right, you sit here, Jerry, and you're like, the day, the day that I have, like, the, the wealth and depth of uh, experience that uh, Amir has. Uh, it's always, it's such a pleasure, like, really listening to you, and uh, I grow every time, uh, you know, you share. Um, we all grow so I, all the time. <laughs> so just to sum it up, I guess, um, you know, just uh, in your vast experience with the really great dev tools, what... And I, maybe this already was covered in the many things that you spoke about, but what really differentiates the great tools from the just okay ones? Okay, yeah. Um, I think that if you, a, a great dev tool is something where the developers themselves are solving a problem. Um, if you are solving a problem for yourself and you've been, uh, in this problem for a very long time, it creates uh, the strongest empathy that you can have because you're a member of the community and you're solving something for yourself and from others. That's where I see the biggest value. Um, I'm now working with a company called uh, Diversion, uh, ah, which I invested Diversion. in. Uh, yeah, they're that. amazing. <laughs> and I'm working with them. amazing. Yeah. Yes, and it, brilliant. And he's like, I've, I've been suffering from, from Git for so long. I want to solve these problems for myself and by that solving for it for others. And I think that's, the, that's where magic happens, where you actually feel the pain in such a fundamental way. And, you're, and, and the, as developers, we're, 
I, I like it. We're the laziest person in the world. We're, we like to solve, to automate our world and to solve our world in, in like with, with code. Um, and if you solve it for yourself and you solve it in a way that you find it uh, amazingly useful, then doing it for others is an extension of that. Uh, and, and that's where magic really happens. Yeah, I agree. It's also kind of, I guess, the backbone of open source eventually, like when not yeah. looking to monetize it, but I mean, at, when you're building, you know, a project that, you know, you found useful or you built for yourself and then you want to kind of share yeah, it with the community. Exactly. And, then, and yeah. also being humble. I think like uh, I always tell my PMs, uh, we can think that an idea is amazing, but our, our opinions doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter anything, right? What's, what's, uh, what matters is reality. What matters is like listening to your developers, to your audience, and continue to iterating and growing and building better products with them. Um, and that's the difference between the ivory tower PMs who like, this is what's good for the masses, and to like uh, developer relations powered PMs, which are like, we're building this together for the benefit of all of us. Active listening. Exactly. <laughs> Well, really Incredible. interesting. Amir, that was amazing. And um, I think that uh, it's about time we uh, have you back uh, in, uh, in Tel Aviv again to join us in, uh, in, for another conference because you've already headlined DevOps Days Tel Aviv for us. And I'm sure Sharon has another 10 you know, uh, sure. <laughs> conferences under her, uh, you know, that she could already think of to invite you to and, and have you on. So we, we still need a rain check on the uh, event that got canceled yeah. right before COVID. It was like our exactly. last event I was trying to get in right before. And it was like, I remember that. Yes. yes. When I grow up, I'll be connected as Sharon is. <laughs> I think uh, I have plenty uh, to learn from you. Uh, wow. This was so much fun. I mean, awesome. Really Thank you so much fun. for having me. And, uh, and yeah. congratulations on a new podcast. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah, Let's episode number one in the bag. So this is fantastic. <laughs> awesome. All we right. hope uh, they're all be as good as this one. Um, we'll hope to keep up the sure they be much better. <laughs> okay. And we'll also and we'll also learn as we go, Sharon. You know, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll get better, and then we'll probably have Amir on again. You know, pretty soon. So. Uh, anytime. If we if we can, it, yeah. Well, if we can, you know, get you know, squeeze your, you know, into your schedule, of course. Of course. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> Thank you for having Amir's me. Amir has always made time. That's something I have to I know. say. Yeah. I think of a shout out. He has never 100%. been like. He always makes time for everyone. That he has just amazing. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And have a good uh, one. You too. Thanks. Thanks, bye -bye. Amir. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.